Welcome to episode 52 of Silver Lining Podcast. I'm Grunkle Rex. We have Adam here, and we have a guest with many titles. Rebecca Adams is an optimist from the very beginning, has watched all of the podcasts. She is an author. She is a podcaster, and she is a an abuse survivor, as a story to tell with that. So we have a lot to talk about here in the podcast, a lot that I think will be interesting to all the optimists. And we appreciate uh, Rebecca's, um, well, the people that have paved the way for optimists here, people that have gotten optimists that have been on before telling their stories because we all benefit from that, from hearing everyone else's story, everyone meaning just normal people, not not celebrities. Celebrities are great too. We're glad to have celebrities on here, but just people that are part of our community telling their story is always compelling. So Rebecca, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. We are glad to have you on. And there are a lot of announcements we could make, but that's why we do lives. We did a live last Saturday and we'll do one this Saturday. So Um, stay tuned to those for announcements and let's get into Rebecca's story, Adam. Yeah, I would love to hear that. And by the way, just in case something goes wrong, uh, Rebecca does have some dogs she saved that we may hear from or not that are laying around starving for a a bone, a treat, something. So if that happens, we already know what's about to go down. So we know we can wait for you. But yeah, let's start back. Um, you know, because you have this long history that you've written books about and you've, um, you know, explained that you've been in a uh, abusive situation. And I think the last three weeks, we've really covered a lot of domestic abuse uh, with with our guest and what that ends up looking like and, and things that happen with domestic abuse. And there's all kinds of abuse. There's physical, mental Um, There's a there's a variety of abuses that people go through in their lives, sexual abuse, all those things. So um, if you want, first of all, just tell us a little bit about you and and, you know, maybe some of the the roads that you traveled. Okay, well, I have now survived 48 years of domestic violence, Mm -hmm. and I'm just so grateful to be on the living side of it, you know, and to be able to to come here and tell you that and. So it started when I was a kid. My dad was abusive, and I'm pulling something out here to show you in a minute. Um, There was literally every kind of abuse in our home as I was growing up. And I didn't find out about a lot of it. Maybe I should say there were aspects of it I did not find out until I was about 30 years old. And my sister started talking to me and saying, well, this happened and that happened. And I said, when? How? And he was, I'm the baby of the family. Okay. So when my brother and sister came along, they were only 21 months apart. So it was like having twins, my mom said. And when they found out that there was a giant surprise coming <laughs> uh, in about nine months, um, my dad said, I am not going to lay a hand on this child because I've already ruined the lives of the other two. And I'm not going to do that with this one. And so he did not beat me physically. He did not abuse me mentally, emotionally, or anything like that. Um, He was among guides. Sorry. That's Um, (laughs) But he was wanting, I could tell he wanted to abuse me sexually. And I could, I could just see in my book, I have it written in there at, I could see his eyes were just dripping with lust for me as a kid. That when I hit about 12. Um, then when I was about, well, let me back up just a little bit. When I was nine, then he filed for divorce from my mom. And that just absolutely rocked my world. Uh, I had been a straight A student literally the year before I got straight A's on my report card all year long in every subject. And then the next year, I just about flunked out of several, you know, at at least a couple that the grades were really going down. And my mom was, was fantastic. She really was. So at that point, did you, did the courts award your mom or did you choose to live with your mom or your dad or how did, how did that go down? 
You know, that's a good question. I don't know how that came out, like in a divorce decree. Okay. I did read it. But you ended, did you end up growing up with your mom, staying with your mom, and then visiting your dad on weekends or anything like that? Or Yeah, it would, okay. he would. He would write or call when he wanted to have my sister and I come visit. I wanted basically nothing to do with him. He, he just became this person I did not know. When I was born, he was doing, and you'll get overwhelmed with this, he was going to seminary full time. He was working a job full time, and he had a little mission church that he was, you know, taking care of. It was way too much on his plate. It just was. And he told me as I got older, I think it was when I was about a year and a half, something like that. He tried to commit suicide. Wow. And yeah, so I mean, there's just there wasn't anything healthy or normal in my life except for my mom, and. <laughs> she was my rock. She just really was. Um, then for about five years, she was single. And then uh, this guy started dating her and they got married. And it was, uh, boy, it was rough on me. It was so hard. So my home became prison. And then since I had to change school districts, I didn't really know hardly anybody there. So that school became my prison because it was a small rural school and the kids just didn't accept me. And they just, and it was miserable. It was horrible. So then when I got, when I graduated, I was, uh, I had been working at a place since I was in high school and finished working it there. And then that's where I met the man that I married. And I just thought he was the best thing since sliced bread. Well, if I had known the red signals to look for, uh, I would not have married him. And that's one reason that I love to go out and speak. I'm also a speaker, and I want to educate anybody that'll listen. And I don't care if it's one person or if I go to uh, to Washington and testify there, you know, in front of our Congress or Senate or whoever. I want to educate people what those red flags are so that they know, because if, if you know, you can avoid it. Yeah. I think in the last couple of interviews that we've talked about, um, domestic, uh, to be, uh, domestic violence and, and abuse that they were mentioning red flags and what are red flags for, like, if you have kids that are in like grown kids that are in a, uh, domestic, you know, relationship that's abusive, or if you're in one, uh, you know, red flags, when should you get out? What, you know, what are you looking for? So in your book and things like that, do you talk about um, when you get into a relationship to look for red flags uh, for like the spouse, if he could be somewhat abusive? Yeah, I do. What I tried to do, I was originally going to tell my story. Then I was going to have a whole other section on how you get out you know, what to look for and then how to get out and how to stay free. Yeah. And I thought, mm-hmm, because some people are not readers and they're not going to want to read two sections. They're just going to want to read my story and then that's it. So I had to go back and rewrite it and weave all of those kind of things into the story. Uh, I know one thing in particular that um, I look back on now and it was a red flag, definitely. We were just dating and he was already wanting to get me away from friends, you know, and family, especially after we got married, then it was a thing of, Oh, your family, you're just too close. You need to, this is just not healthy. This isn't right. And so that part never stopped. One thing that he did that I can remember, it's when we would go somewhere, we were walking into a store and he literally grabbed my hand. I mean, he didn't just, grab my hand to hold it you know mm-hmm. it was to grab my hand and i thought what in the world well that should have been a red flag right there you don't go grabbing somebody else's hand and and then uh later on as the relationship progressed he would get a hold of my uh, upper arm above my elbow and ordinarily yes you know a man can do that and they can help steer the woman where they're going they she's gonna go right but he wants to go left and, and i get that Mm-hmm. But not when it's like this. 
yeah. around your arm. You know, that's, and so there are things like that. Another thing was, um, even for our wedding rehearsal, I needed to be there to let a friend in who was going to play the organ. And when he saw her, he made some crude comments that were totally unnecessary. That should have been a red flag. He's not going to accept my friends. He's not going to accept me where I am or my friends or family. Um, Sorry, that's my that's my blood sugar. Stand by. Oh no! I get a you get you you have dog you have dogs. I have blood sugar. Okay, good. Okay, I just checked it. We're we're okay. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Right. Okay. Good. So let's let's start here. So you so your your dad was did he sexually abuse you? Is that what you're saying? Or he no, wanted I, to? You don't really know. To, he he wanted to. I do have a very 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 vague memory of being about two three years old, maybe four at the oldest. Yeah. In the bathtub, getting a bath. And that a couple of times somebody came in and they were messing with me. Yeah. But I don't, you know. But he, but he did, he did physically abuse your brother and sister growing up is what you're saying. Oh, yeah. Bad. Okay. So you witnessed, you witnessed things? I did. I can remember four years of age. This is back in the horse and buggy days. Yeah. (laughs) Old, old school. We call that. We don't, we don't even go any further than that. We just call it old school. Very much old school. And Mm -hmm. so. The women had to wear hats and gloves to church and be all dressed up. Yeah. The men had to have their their shoes signed. They had to wear a suit, you know, to church. And uh, so I was, I don't know, I was probably in my room playing. I don't know where I was. And I heard this horrible commotion going on. And so I went out to find out what's going on. It was, the, it was in the living room. My dad was furious because my brother had forgotten to shine their shoes. It was his job to shine the shoes for dad and for himself. And he literally had taken my brother, who would have been about um, 10 or 11, something like that. He picked him up by his shirt collar and he was slamming him up against the wall over and over and just yelling at him him literally off the floor. And I thought, what in the world? I've never seen that happen. Yeah. So my sister told me he always tried to get me out of the house so that I didn't witness those kind of things. Yeah. So you had, so in childhood, your dad was abusive. You married a guy that you saw saw red flags, but you didn't listen to your, your gut feeling. As Rex would say, your- Want it. Yeah, your, your guidance system. And a lot of times when we, when we have that feeling inside going- what in the world? He's grabbing my hand. What kind of what? Who does this? And then the way he talked to the your best friend who came in to do the thing, like what kind of guy talks like this? So you you had all these things inside you going. You know what? I my gut feeling is telling me I need to you know call this thing off. The hard thing about that is sometimes um, if you go all the way in and you're supposed to be married and you've already got everything you know the plans and all these things going on. And you're like, I don't know if I should marry this person or not. Your gut feeling is telling you don't do here. And I'm sure this has happened to millions of people. I'm not talking hundreds or thousands. I really think it's happened to a lot of people where you you don't listen to your gut. You don't listen to your internal guidance system. You avoid it because you don't want to be the one to, to stop the wedding, to stop you know, this, or it's embarrassing, or you're going to have to answer to people or whatever the consequences are for you following your internal guidance system. Instead, a lot of times we just go with the flow and ignore that. So we don't have to deal with that. But then later in life, it always comes up to be a a bad decision when you really don't follow your internal guidance system. In fact, Adam, let me insert this. Um, Rebecca wrote a book. Here's a Let me show it on Amazon for you to soar, okay? And look how it, look how the description starts out here. Within 24 hours after her wedding, Rebecca knew she had married the wrong man. That's just what we're talking about here. She knew it, knew it right away. She had that. Now, had that been 24 hours before? Then what Adam said, even then it might be too late. You were seeing those signals going into it but that's her book on amazon and 
Um, she recently put out the Kindle version, and there's a paperback version of it, and an electron. Well, that's the Kindle version, and an audio. Yes. So Rebecca's book, Free to Soar, is available on Amazon and all those different uh, different media. Sorry to nice. the story, Rebecca. Yes, you funny. and you were this in your childhood, your teen years, and then in your in your marriage also. How did you how did you recognize it, and break away from it? It took well, I knew things weren't right, you know, just like it says on the back of the book, twenty four hours after I got married. But guys, I had taken an oath before God at the altar. I was not going to turn around and do what my father had done to my mom and file for divorce. That just would, I mean, who goes to the altar to say, I do, and then turn around and immediately say, I don't, you know, I mean, this was my thinking, my logic. Uh, and so I, I think at that point, I just hunkered down and tried to make the best of it, mm-hmm. best that I could. I do not recommend that (laughs) because it was about 10 or 11 years into the marriage that it finally hit me that this is called abuse. And I began to see that I still didn't see all the different types of abuse that I hadn't been educated on that either. But I began to see that, yes, it was abuse and that I needed to get out. Well, that put me into a deep depression because it didn't matter how I tried to logically think this through this was back before there were places safe places for women to go and i had three little kids by this time i had to get this guys i had four pregnancies in four and a half years do you want to know how to spell that it's f-t-o-o-o-o-o-o-o-p-i-d stupid (laughs) Yeah, that's that. Well, it's it's something that's for sure. That's I mean, that's pretty impressive that you can do that one and keep those four kids alive. I mean, that's amazing. Um, so so you uh, tell me what was the rock bottom for you when you got out of your marriage, or did you get out of the marriage? Did you still stay in even though you knew you should have got out? Yes, I did. I stayed in. Yeah. So that ten or eleven year mark, uh, and I saw. I just saw no way out. And I went into a massive depression. That was probably my lowest point ever in my life. And I, I can't even tell you how long it lasted. It, it might have been three months. It might have been two years. I don't know. No. I mean, it, it was that dark of a time period. I don't even know how long it lasted. Wow. And I just, I saw no way to get any kind of resolution whatsoever. So I still just hung in there. I did. You now, know. did your did your kids witness abuse? Him abusing you? Yes, because see, he now he, one thing he never did. It was the only boundary my mom ever talked about. She said, "Well, if he ever hits me, I'm gone." And so that was that was all I offered. Example. So I told him, I said, as things started getting a little rough, you know, and I said. Tell you what, you lay a hand on me and I'm out of here. So he knew that boundary. Of course, his code back had to be more powerful than mine. And he said, You come back, you're, or you leave, you're never coming back. So the fact, I'm wondering, I'm wondering how many relationships have, have, have done, have done the same as you. Like you're in this relationship, you know, it's abusive. uh, You don't feel the love. You're walking on eggshells. You do this for years and years and years when you're home all these things and you just don't know how or what resources or who you are you going to go to your friend's house and stay live with them like all these things go through your head is like how am i going to get out of this um and so because the easier way is to stay in it because it's something you're already familiar with and you've learned to survive you turn into a survivor in your own house basically right you really do and my thing is I knew he would never leave. He's a very powerful personality, kind of an overtaking, overpowering kind of a guy. So I knew I couldn't kick him out. He says, Marhouse, you can't do that. Yeah. Well, then I knew I couldn't take my, where 
where do you go with three kids when you don't have a job? I was a stay at home mom. Mm-hmm. So, okay, where does that lead? You know? Yeah. Come to find out, I did have uh, people that told me after the fact, they said, well, if I'd known you were going through that, I would have, you know, done this or that, or you could have come to live with me or. Yeah. But you don't know that at the time. Yeah. Because you, you don't dare talk about what's going on to your friends. Especially, especially back then. I mean, here it is now, 2024, and it seems like there's so much more that's out in the open. But back then, people didn't talk about problems because the time was different. Every The 60s, 70s, and 80s, the, the, I think maybe in the 90s, it started becoming more open and 2000s, obviously. But back, back in the day, you, yeah, a lot of things went you know undetected. Yes, very much so. Unreported, etc. Yeah, uh, and you keep referencing. There's so many people out there that are going through what I went through. The stats are that one out of three women have been sexually abused. I, this is my own personal thing. I challenge that because I have been vocal since I left. And since I've had a chance to speak with the book and so forth, and I talk to people, and uh, I'm telling you, it's like one out of every two women have said, I've been through abuse too. And I was able to leave him, and I'm now remarried to a really great guy. And uh, I I just think it's a lot more than that. But that's what's reported. Yeah. Well, you know. But who knows what's not being reported? Because there's, yeah, it's 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 hard to, to report that stuff. So- in your book, you're writing about your life, your childhood, you're writing about your marriage, you're writing about abuse. What has been your your you, you hit the rock bottom? How did you how did you heal from that or how what are you what what can you tell people that uh helped you, you know, get to the place you are now because you mentioned depression. And, you know, depression and anxiety go hand in hand and we hear about it a lot on 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 this podcast because a lot of people go through that i and i'm not a depressed person but i went through a huge depression with Lori's situation um and so i understand depression and anxiety now before i never did um how did you come out of that or are you still coming out of it or do you feel in a good spot where you are now you know it was just last week that i said to a friend i said i am now at a place after, okay, I've been through 48 years of domestic violence. I have been free from my ex-husband for over 21 years. And I'm just now able to look at you and say, I am finally enjoying life. Yeah, so it ta- it's a long road is what you're saying. It is. And I'm still going through counseling. And I'll tell you what, you guys are the reason that I started back into counseling. Oh, yeah. What exactly. what's that story? Is that a good or a bad effect? That's oh, that was a good effect. <laughs> oh, okay. After listening to you, I need a counseling again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you had talked about both of you would talk quite frequently about uh counseling and going to counseling and Rex with your six hundred counselors or whatever you supposedly have. <laughs> I like that she's she's giving you more much numbers than I know. I started with three or four I thought you were saying I started with five and I I'm down to two now again for Rex. <laughs> well, I I was just as always, I was just dealing with stuff and I made a comment on one of your uh podcasts and I said, I really recommend that you do go to counseling when you're ready for it because it's just made such a difference. I've been through counseling several different times, but boy, I was starting to to go back down again. And I'll tell you why. Uh, when I, I went back through my book and I revised it. And so I update you now. And I went between that and then right after that, it was like maybe a few weeks later and I did the audio portion. So that means I'm reading my book. Twice of going back through everything I've experienced, but you know, it's crazy. You forget some things. Mm-hmm. And it threw me, those two things threw me into a new depression. And I was like, oh my goodness, I think I'm going to have to go back in counseling again. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I'm ever going to get out of it, actually. 
I have a wonderful counselor now, and she is taking me through all sorts of things. Right now, what I'm starting in on is grief. Uh, you would be amazed, and I will. I can send it to you in by email, and you can use it as you want. Um, what is what can be considered grief? It's amazing. It's things you would never think of. Wow. Um, all the moves that I've been through. I know, Adam, you've moved a lot, and Rex, you have too. Well, Rex has moved more than anybody in the U.S. I'm going to put his record against anybody. Anybody. No one's moved 60 times, except for maybe mm-hmm. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I moved 28 times. I'm living in my 28th house, and, and I cannot even fathom your 60, Rex. That just <laughs> blows my mind. That's growing. Last I heard, it was 57, but I yeah, that's <laughs> really a number of counselors. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so you're saying you found a therapist that you enjoyed that's helping you and you're understanding grief more. Um, so with grief, that's one of the things I think for me anyway, is that I don't know if I've I've dealt with a lot of the grief that I've been through. And, you know, there's different things that I'm going to try. I'm definitely going to try some uh, therapy at some point, some kind of therapy. Um, finding the right therapist for me, I'll have to figure who that is and, and how that goes down. Uh, and when is that going to happen? Like you said, you, here you are 21 years later to a week ago, you said, I finally feel like I'm happy. And so think about that. 21 years is a long time to go through something and progress something for healing. Um, and Rex has talked about this before. He goes, I, I I don't know if anybody is going to be healed to where you were before uh, because it's such a process. You're, we're, we're continuing to heal. But healing could be a different definition. Like, I can get up and get out of bed uh, and go go to work where before I had to lay in bed and didn't want to move. So mm-hmm. that that's part of healing. I guess progression is, I guess, part of healing. It is. It really is. Um, sorry, this I'm in those senior moments, and you said something, and I was going to reply to that. Definitely. I talk, I talk too much. You should have just cut me off right then and there. Stop. <laughs> do that. I got to say something. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I did want to point out that in the back of my book, it's more than just an autobiography. Um, God really put this on my heart to write my book. <clears throat> I didn't want to. I really fought God on this, and I really got mad at God. And I would I would go through periods of time where yeah I would write, and then I I would just have to stop because it was too overwhelming and I just couldn't handle going back there. And I know you two understand that after you wrote the book that you did that wonderful book, Lori's Lives and Family Ties. I know you understand that. Um, and so it took me starting and stopping and starting and stopping. It probably took me a total of something like eight years before I really got it done. And it was very, very, very healing. But I asked Lord, I said, okay, so it's a book. Great. Another autobiography on the shelf. Big deal. And then I got the idea, and I knew this was the Lord. At the very end, I have two different sections. I have one section that defines and gives examples of every single kind of abuse. And then I have another section after that, because you got to remember when this was written, the internet was not like super popular and not everybody carried around a little computer in their hand and stuck it in their pocket, right? Mm-hmm. And so I have all sorts of resources in there that people can go to to just give them a jumping off point, you know? So it, it's way more than just my story. Rex is going to have to start revising our book. It might take him eight years because I'm not going to be involved in that. But <laughs> he's better. He's better at crossing uh, T's and dotting I's than I am. So Rex, just start now. Maybe eight years from now, you can be done with that. Eight years is a generous estimate. I'm old. <laughs> I may not have eight years. So. I was surprised at how quickly you two wrote your book. I was so impressed. Were we? Well, you know, I had been, I had been writing I had been writing my part of the book for four years, so I had a lot of my stuff already written. Um, and then, but the, to edit that and to put it all together, Jane did a great job. And Rex, you know, just wrote his that his first or second book that he's ever written, 
And there are some things in there about your internal guidance system that really made sense for what we were talking about with Chad and Lori's decisions that just made everything made sense. And that's how those two things, my story and Rex's uh, situation, where they combined and it really made sense. That's how I think the book reads the way it reads. I think it reads pretty smooth like that. It really does. I listened to the audio version because I can listen to podcasts and whatever while I'm working. And so I listened to your book while I was working. Oh, my goodness. It was so good. Um, I I apologize for crying throughout. It's so it's so embarrassing. It's so embarrassing. Well, I'm sure, guy, it is. Honestly, to be to be really real with you, a woman appreciates a man who can cry. And the fact that you both have teared it up on your podcast and as you were reading the book for the audible version it touches my heart. It really does. Um, I, yeah. Well, one, one thing, one reason, another reason that I went to counseling is that I used to be able to just cry at the drop of the hat. I could go up to some guy in a uniform and say, thank you for your service, and just be tears streaming down my face. I can't cry anymore. And so I that was one thing I asked the counselor about. And she said, after she heard a little bit of my story, she said, you have compassion fatigue. And I said, oh, wow, okay. Because I was I was not only working full time, I was doing this podcast, which I was doing all the editing, and I had to learn how to do that. I am not a geek with electronics at all. Well, Rex and I are, we're experts yeah. at podcasting. Yeah, you know, that editing. We, you could have just called us. I should have. I should have reached out to you. <laughs> yeah, I had to. I had to learn how to do all of that. So at the worst, it took me 12 hours to edit one session, one, one podcast, one episode. Yeah. And that's, that's well, I'm, full time. I think, it, I think it's amazing that you, you've had the life that you've had. And again, our podcast is called Silver Linings because we're looking for people who, who can actually uh, talk about the silver linings in their life for you to go through you know, 48 years of different types of abuse and come out with writing a book to help people, helping people recognize red flags in these kinds of relationships. Um, you know, like you said, listing all the different abuses and definitions so people can, you know, better understand that. Talking about grief and how grief is a different thing for a lot of people. And you can use, so all the, all the things that you're bringing to the table are going to help other people, whether they read your book or they reach out to you on email or whatever the case may be that you're turning your depression that you had and all the, the grief that you've had in your life, not being able to cry and all the things that you've gone through that you're turning this into a silver lining. Again, Rex and I appreciate everybody who can do that um, because it just makes a it makes a huge difference for a lot of people in their lives. It really does. And what was it? What's the name of the podcast you did, Rebecca, for two years? Well, we decided to just call it Free to Soar, just like the title of my book. That way it talks it all together. Mm -hmm. And we've done over 100 videos on there. Um, I still need to go back in and do some more work and do some marketing make some reels, put them on Facebook, and I'm going to uh, apply for a couple of different places to put our podcasts on different networks. Um, so there's still more to be done, but I'm just, my counselor said, she said, I don't want you to do anything until you feel ready. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was, I was working two full-time jobs and doing all the rest of it. So it's different thing. <laughs> Smart, good advice. So yeah. just a reminder to everyone, name of the podcast and the book and the audio book, the Kindle version, paperback, free to soar, available on Amazon, of course, by Rebecca Adams. And Rebecca, it's so good of you to come on and tell your story. Uh, we have other people that are waiting till they're ready, You know, whether that means getting up the courage or being able to talk about it, just just because it's it's a scary process, isn't it, to come on? Of course, you have podcast experience, but uh, every time an optimist comes on, I think it emboldens other optimists to be able to do it. So thank you not only for sharing your story, but also for um, just blazing the trail so so others can follow too. Absolutely. I, can I just say a couple more things before we quit? 
Sure, sure. We love it. I don't know how close we are to being out of time. How are we doing at the time? Well, Sean's not here. And yeah, we're we're good. Do you tell tell us what you want to say? <laughs> we're okay. We're not hearing any out music to kick you off, so go ahead. <laughs> we love Sean. Oh, he does a great job. He really does. Um <clears throat> One thing that I'm just now able to talk about, and I've always probably talked to two or three people about this, is that what I experienced for the better part of the 22 and a half years I was married was a term that I was not familiar with, but it was literally, and because it was on YouTube, I'm going to have to spell one of the words, but it's literally marital R-A-P-E. Mm-hmm. Because that's that's what it was. And I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't know that wasn't even possible. Um, and my first counselor after I after I left my ex, she said, Well, and she wanted me to explain some things that I did, and she said, Well, that's R A P E. That's what exactly what it is. And I said, But we were married. She said, I know. But it's still very possible. So that's one thing. Another thing I also have had to go into the courtroom several times for different things, including a child in need of care case for my grandchildren, um, things like that. Very, very stressful. And I just want you to know, especially Rex, since you went, but I had both of you on my heart and your whole family just praying for you because I know how hard that is. And I that if, you know, what I went through was not a worldwide known case, but when I saw you, Rex, and you were going to uh, Lori's trial on the, that first one you went, and I knew they were going to show the autopsy photos, and I said it out loud to you, but you didn't hear me, and I said, because <laughs> I said, well, there's Rex Hunter right there, and I said, Rex, no. He's you like, know. nope, doop to do let me walk in here with my daughters yep let me hug everybody and say hi to everybody yeah that's exactly what he did he didn't listen to me at all yeah no i didn't because i didn't see the photos so well i did later just because i went back later when they showed him for the uh closing yeah but But yeah so going to court's a hard hard thing i'm sure yeah it's awful it's absolutely awful went there for um well, like I don't need to go into all that, but yeah, it is horrible. And at one point, um, the man that I was hoping to be my ex husband was right there and he had his briefcase and he was pulling out file uh, because he had experience in the courtroom. Um and I thought, Yeah, here we go. Yeah, you've got proof, all right. I've got proof too. <laughs> Yeah, fighting in the courts a, a, a hard thing, but I, I got to tell you, I, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story with us. And I, I, you know, urge people to read your book that's been through abuse. That if it can help people understand or get out of a abusive relationship or see red flags or you know all the things that you mentioned in the book that can help people. So again, um, you know, Rebecca, thank you for being brave and coming on and sharing your story and and trying to help people with with your book and podcast. Absolutely. And the gal who was on my podcast with me is an expert in the field. She had been the executive director of the crisis center in Taney County. That's in the brands of the area. Uh, She's had that job for 27 years, I believe. Nice. A lot of experience. And And her name? Becky Vermeer. Becky Vermeer. And if you go onto our uh, YouTube channel, all of our contact information is in there. Excellent. So you can access her. Yeah, her um, her email address is in there, and you can get in touch with her. And she's great. Great. That's her stuff. She's an expert witness in the uh, in the courts for domestic violence cases. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. Well, thank you. So, Optimus is Rebecca Adams, free to soar. Hope you'll follow up on it. And I know you've gotten a lot out of this. Adam and I surely have. Thanks for being with us and take care.